So welcome everyone. I'm Nancy Netzer, the inaugural Robert L. and Judith T. Winston Director of the McMullen Museum and Professor of Art History at Boston College. I want to welcome all of you members and special guests, many tuning in from distant time zones to the preview day lecture for the exhibition Taking Shape, Abstraction from the Arab World, 1950s to the 1980s. It's wonderful to see so many of you attending this webinar. And I'm just gonna share my screen. <clears throat> the McMullen is honored to present this landmark exhibition devoted to 58 outstanding artists from across the Middle East and North Africa. These are artists who expanded the parameters of abstract painting in the mid 20th century. The exhibition's 88 examples have been selected from one of the finest collections of works of their kind assembled by Sultan al Qasimi for the Barjil Art Foundation based in Sharjah, United Arab Emirates. Taking Shape opens in our daily family and moaning galleries to the Boston College community by appointment tomorrow. On March 4th, we'll launch a digital walkthrough of the exhibition on our website. And later that week, we'll begin providing weekly virtual docent led tours of the exhibition. In conjunction with a robust lineup of courses, lectures, and other public programs that we're offering in collaboration with the Art, Art History, and Film Department, Taking Shape aims to engage our campus and the broader community in conversations about how to tell the story of mid 20th century abstraction as a global development. And I invite you to click on the events tab menu on our McMullen website. There you will find a list of the virtual programs that we've organized to enhance the exhibition and for which you're all welcome to register free of charge. The project we celebrate today is the culmination of many years work. For the McMullen, who were relative latecomers to the game, the story began in 2018, when we were introduced to Sultan al Qasimi, founder of the Barjil Collection, by Professor Kathleen Bailey, who chairs our Islamic Civilization and Societies program. We came away from our first meeting with Sultan impressed by the scope of the foundation he has built, his knowledge of and dedication to the artists of the Middle East, and his commitment to rethinking the position of those artists, be they Muslims, Christians, or Jews, within the traditional art historical narrative. We emerged eager to collaborate with the Barjil Foundation on an exhibition that would present an opportunity to expand the art historical canon with modern artists from the Middle East. When Sultan told us that the Barjil's chief curator, Suhaila Takesh, and the director of the Gray Art Gallery at NYU, Lynn Gumpert, were in the process of co-curating an exhibition to be organized by the Gray Art Gallery, that focused on early ventures into modern abstraction in the Arab world, we signed on immediately as a venue. As co-editors of the exhibition's catalog, Takesh and Gumpert have enlisted the finest scholars in the field, including themselves, as contributors. Kathleen Bailey did her magic in convincing Sultan to teach a course at Boston College that highlighted the 58 artists in the exhibition just as it debuted last January at the Gray Art Gallery in New York. 
with Professor of Film John Mahalchik as producer. Sultan and his students were able to film interviews with many of the artists at Taking Shapes opening in New York. Several of the students had plans to travel abroad to interview many of the other artists, but unfortunately, those plans all fell apart when the pandemic put a halt to travel last spring. We then took the few completed interviews and the McMullen's assistant director, John McCoy, edited them and made them available for download from the McMullen website. <clears throat> In the meantime, Sultan has made plans to conduct the remaining interviews. So John Mahalchik may produce his feature length film dedicated to this groundbreaking exhibition. I invite you to watch John Mahalchik's three minute trailer for the film on the McMullen website. I want to take this opportunity to extend our congratulations <clears throat> and heartfelt thanks to co-curators Suhaila Takesh and Lynn Gumpert and founder of the Bar Shield Art Foundation, Sultan al Qasimi. We owe a large debt of gratitude to John Mahalchik and his film team, Bob Heim and Sierra Duffy, and to our colleagues at the Gray Art Gallery, especially Ali Mintz, Michelle Wong, Lori Duke, and Allegra Favila, and of course, also to Kathleen Bailey. As always, we're indebted to our team at the McMullen. Assistant Director Diana Larson designed the galleries brilliantly to show off the paintings to their best advantage, to establish provocative juxtapositions, and at the same time, to accommodate social distancing during viewing. Assistant Director John McCoy designed the exhibition didactics website and edited the videos. Manager of Publications and Exhibitions, Kate Schugert, oversaw organization of the exhibition on our end. And Rachel Chamberlain, Manager of Education, Outreach and Digital Resources, has overseen creation of the digital walkthrough and our long list of virtual programs. <clears throat> the McMullen docents chaired by Sharon Bazarian deserve our gratitude for mastering the biographies of artists little known to Americans in order to share the gems of taking shape with our audiences on virtual tours. The spirit of collaboration carried over into other areas of our university as well. And in this regard, we'd like to single out the chair of our art, art history and film department, Stephanie Leone, and two new professors in the department at Boston College, Emine Fatbachi and Kevin Lodery, each of whom will provide virtual lectures in our events roster this semester. As always, the museum extends special thanks for the ongoing support of those who make our exhibitions possible. The administration of Boston College and the McMullen Family Foundation. And we especially thank Jacqueline McMullen, President Leahy, Provost Quigley, Dean Kalsher, and the patrons of the McMullen Museum chaired by Mike Daly. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the co-curator of Taking Shape, Suhaila Takesh. Unfortunately, Sultan al Qasimi is unable to join her to say a few words because he is literally in transit now on the train from New York to Boston and he is waving to you on the screen. And we're waving back to him. Suhaila Takesh, as I mentioned earlier, is the curator of the Bargeo Art Foundation based in Sharjah. And it's from there, halfway across the world, where it is 9 p.m. that she joins us today. 
Suhaila Takesh, however, is no stranger to Boston. She received her master's degree in history, theory and criticism of architecture and art at MIT, where she was a student in the Aga Khan program for Islamic architecture. She's curated many exhibitions, including several at the Sharjah Art Museum, the Contemporary Art Platform in Kuwait, and the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. And her scholarly articles have appeared in Thresholds and the Rutgers Art Review. This afternoon, she will introduce us to Taking Shape. And then we'll take questions, which you may submit in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So please join me in congratulating and welcoming Suhaila Takesh as she shares her screen. Thank you very much, Nancy, for the kind introduction and hi to everybody in the audience. I will share my screen. Um, all right, well, um, thanks again, Nancy. I am so excited that the exhibition is finally traveling after almost a year. Um, I don't know what kind of restrictions are currently in place and how many of our attendees are um, in Boston currently, but I do hope that many of you uh, will make it to the exhibition and see it in person before it closes in the summer. Uh, for today's talk, I do not have a pre prepared text. I thought this could be more of a conversation style session today. Um, but to give you a brief overview of kind of the very loose structure that the, uh, that the talk will take, um, I can first share a little bit about the Barjit Art Foundation uh, with the audience, uh, for those of you who might be unfamiliar with the collection and the scope of the collection. Um, then we can uh, speak a little about the curatorial process for taking shape and the kind of questions and strategies and challenges that Lynn and I faced and putting the show together, and then we will delve into the um, artworks that are currently on display at the McMullen Museum. And, uh, you know, just to give you sort of a taste of what you might see uh, when you do visit. Um, sorry. So the Barjit Art Foundation is a, um, an institution which is centered around a private collection of art uh, assembled and uh, still being assembled by Sultan Saud al Qasimi, who is with us today, but um, uh, as Nancy mentioned, on a train. Um, the scope of the collection covers the modern and contemporary period, so it um, holds works from the 20th and the 21st centuries and geographically it spans across the Arabic speaking regions of North Africa and West Asia or in other words the Arab world um, and also those artists who um, have Arab heritage but are practicing internationally so um, those artists uh, working in the diaspora or second third generation um, immigrants or refugees from the region. And here in this photograph are um, some of the collections holdings, which are currently on display at the Sharjah Art Museum here in the United Arab Emirates. So while this did begin as a private collection, um, in, in 2009 slash 10, um, Sultan formally established the Barjil Art Foundation, opening up the collection to the public. And um, as you can imagine, you know, uh, because it is a private collection, um, a lot of the acquisitions decisions do depend on the sort of tastes and preferences of the collector. However, after having opened the collection up to, um, to the public and to sort of public access, um, the, and particularly, you know, even more so in more recent years, the, um, a sort of aim or aspiration of the collection became or shifted to more towards the documentation, uh, but also 
to providing sort of a site for the critical inquiry of regional, social, and political histories. So some of the artworks that are collected and acquired for the uh, Bargil Foundation are, um, you know, sort of acquired because of their historical, art historical value, while others um, are added to the collection because of the, uh, you know, sort of because of how reflective they are of the political and social conditions of their times. Um, so after the foundation opened with its first exhibition in Sharjah in 2010, it was in March in 2010, that the first show uh, was inaugurated. A few short years after, parts of the collection began traveling internationally, whether um, in, uh, in the capacity of loans to other institutions um, in other parts of the world, or as curated shows. And our collaboration with the Gray Art Gallery at NYU on this exhibition of abstract art was very much part of those efforts to, um, to work together with um, institutions from across the world and also to make this art available for a wider viewership and to encourage um, sort of more scholarship and study and just curiosity about this art and these artists. So the idea to uh, focus on abstraction for this particular exhibition was actually Lynn's idea. Uh, she spoke uh, with Sultan um, in 2017 when Sultan was at the Kevorkian Center about the possibility of working together and suggested to focus on abstract art. And um, the following year in 2018, we spent some time together in our storage facility here in Sharjah, uh, going and sifting through the physical collection and kind of making a rough preliminary selection of works, um, you know, in those few days. Of course, this first selection kind of kept contracting and shrinking, uh, you know, uh, sort of, sorry, expanding and shrinking throughout the curatorial process, you know, more so expanding than shrinking because new acquisitions were happening as we were curating the show. But uh, you know that the, this very um, approach that we took in the beginning of, of our curatorial process can already uh, be indicative to some of you of the kind of challenges and perhaps problems that one may face when we are uh, trying to, uh, you know, study and curate uh, modernity from contexts, you know, uh, from around the world and more specifically from non-Western non uh, uh, sort of contexts. And um, I think it's a challenge that translates to the study of modernity um, across different disciplines, not just in the arts, but, you know, when you um, sort of uh, use a model, an art historical model, which is predicated um, on a, the European Enlightenment and sort of formed within the uh, Western academe, you are also relying on the methodologies, the terminology, the categories that are inherent in that model. And uh, what we discovered, you know, as we continued to work on the show, that um, these uh, categories and, um, methods you know of analysis or perhaps uh, descriptions don't always apply to the objects that we had on our hands so these two photographs are are from those early days um, when we met uh, with Lynn in our warehouse actually the one on the right might be from a later time I uh, <laughs> um, uh, they kind of got mixed up in my files now but you know those are uh, from those initial phases of, of sifting through the physical collection and, you know, um, as I said, initially, we kind of just singled out those works that to us looked abstract, you know, things that were non-figurative, non-objective. Um, and it's, it was only later when we delved deeper into the research that we came to recognize the kind of layered complexity and multiplicity of questions and theories and, uh, you know, movements and intellectual trajectories that these artists were on, which were not often kind of steeped in um, the understanding of abstraction uh, as it pertained to a uh, European context in the early 20th century, which is how most of us are familiar with uh, or become familiar 
with you know modern abstract art it is through that moment in early 20th european century with uh you know very well-known figures like kandinsky and malevich and mondrian that we associate with the kind of uh, uh formation of modern abstraction um so before we delve into the the artworks in the exhibition, um, I thought that perhaps it would also be um, informative to uh, kind of discuss other types of challenging challenges that go into curating um, an exhibition like this. So of course, you know, one set of challenges was methodological, this idea of, you know, how do we frame these works? What kind of questions do we begin asking of them um, because, you know, of course, on the one hand, it was very important for us to position this art as being an integral part of global modernism and to, you know, acknowledge that these artists and groups and collectives were in active dialogue with their peers from elsewhere, from other parts of the world. But at the same time, it was also important for us to account for the specificities of the contexts in which these works were produced. and. Um, you know, uh, in order to help us maybe understand them a little better or to find new ways of reading them. So while, you know, that's one set of questions that we, uh, you know, Lynn and I had to grapple with, on the other hand, you know, um, we were faced with this question of, um, if, of, you know, how comprehensive can a show like this really be, right? Uh, because the Arab world or, you know, North Africa and West Asia is a very expansive geographic area, which is by no means homogenous. There is a multitude of different linguistic and ethnic and religious and social groups that make up the, the population of the region. So it's very diverse. It's definitely not a monolith. And so, you know, how do you really represent uh, the history of the entire region in a single show, I um, don't think <laughs> it can ever really be possible. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, we were also working from a single collection, uh, which in many ways is a blessing. But on the other hand, you know, no matter how expansive um, the collection is, it is also a finite pool of artworks and artists that you're working with, right? So. Uh, this is another kind of conundrum we were faced with of how to reconcile these um, seemingly, you know, contradicting conditions that we found ourselves in. Um, and all right, so I think um, not to kind of uh, give too much detail away, but um, what we ended up doing is kind of creating a more open ended uh, narrative where we uh, managed to find a few strands, historical strands that kind of made sense and um, uh, either read in parallel to one another and sometimes intersected. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the objective really became to open up the conversation for further research and uh, to acknowledge that these histories were very complex and very layered and didn't really happen in straightforward kind of neat ways. Um, so in diving into the works from the exhibition, what I thought we could do is rather than running you very quickly through the 80 plus works that are currently on display at the McMullen, um, I thought what would be more meaningful is if we only uh, focus on a few, but really zoom in and try to understand the histories behind them and the, the kind of questions that the artists were grappling with. So um, one of the first uh, strands in that you'll see in the exhibition is um, from North Africa. This is the Casablanca School in Morocco, which I think has one of the sort of largest um, representations in the exhibition. We have, I think, over 10 artworks from this particular school. And the Casablanca School was an avant-garde collective that was formed in Morocco in the 1960s or in 1965, to be more precise. And it grew out of the Casablanca School for, um, of Art, which, you know, makes the name a little bit uh, confusing. Now, this was a time, the moment around the 50s was a time of decolonization in the region. And um, this is when several countries uh, 
we're coming onto the global stage as independent nation states and beginning to formulate their distinct identities. And of course that translated into the arts, um, you know, artists um, as well as architects and designers were all beginning to ask themselves, what does it mean to create a national art? What would that look like? What is the visual language? What are the historical references and so on? And um, there was really this pointed move towards de the decolonization of arts and culture in several places in the region at this time. And Casablanca was definitely one of them. And uh, they actually recognized if, very aptly an important thing that in order to decolonize culture, you also need to decolonize the education models that, uh, you know, that were being used for art students in, in, in art academies, because prior to this moment, they were largely based on um, the French colonial model of instruction in these, um, even in the Casablanca school itself. And in the 60s, when Farid Belkahia became the director and this collective formed, they um, not only introduced um, classes in local craftsmanship, you know, like woodworking and metalwork um, into the curriculum, but they also encouraged students to go back and study um, sort of local heritage and indigenous histories and look at Amazigh, um, body tattoos and embroidery and study those objects and mine them for references to very site-specific modernisms. So um, the work here on the far right, the wooden work was made by Muhammad Shaba, who also taught a woodworking um, uh, class or, you know, wood shop in at the school. And uh, in the exhibition, we have a work by one of his students, Amina Agizne. Um, it's the same work that we've seen already in this slide here on the, on the right. And it's not apparent um, in this picture, but it's actually a wood relief, um, uh, which she produced during her time as a student at the school. Um, one of, here's another example of, you know, um, a student exercise that was assigned um, at the school, uh, you know, to, to the uh, trainees at the school, uh, where they were asked to look at Amazigh jewelry pieces and to examine those objects for, um, you know, their formal elements and then reinterpret them or rather reinvent them in new and modern ways. So, you know, this was a, an attempt um, to definitely create something that was modern and was internationally relevant, but something that had its roots in the local context. And uh, by doing that, they really aspired towards creating, um, you know, in some ways a more, let's say, authentic uh, expression of who they are and articulating their identities in this way. Uh, this is one of the more famous pictures of the uh, Casablanca School Collective, I think, um, was taken from, the 19, uh, from 1969 when they staged this open air show in uh, Marrakesh and uh, years, you know, where they basically painted on and had hung paintings on directly on the walls in the city in this open square where they remained, I believe, for, uh, you know, something like two weeks. And in a later um, interview, Muhammad uh, uh, Melehi, who's seen here at the, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but he's on the far right of the photograph. Um, uh, he said, you know, for them, this was sort of, in some ways, a way to challenge the government um, and to explore what art can be. And also as a, uh, I don't want to use the word insult, but you know, maybe a challenge towards the more traditional um, art salon model, which was common in Morocco at this time. Um, now, another strand um, that you might find running through the exhibition is the use of geometry and mathematics in constructing uh, these non-objective, non-figurative uh, works by uh, modernists from the region. And one of the first um, artists to articulate in writing um, 
the potential, the, you know, sort of the potentiality of Islamic geometry to lie to to be trans to be translated to and to lie the basis of modern art uh, was the Lebanese artist Salwar Abdel Shukir, um, whose wooden sculpture Interform you could see in this picture, and she wrote. Um, uh, an article, a journal article in Beirut in 1951, where she uh, discussed this, you know, quite contentious notion of essence, uh, not only in visual art, but also in literature and in philosophy and um, in Islamic geometry. And the reason I say, you know, uh, the idea of essence is a contentious one is because it sort of pre um, uh, presupposes that there's an elusive ideal of sorts that exists. And you know, <laughs> that could be anything, right? I mean, who knows what that is? But I think when discussing um, art and you know, such as Islamic geometry or art inspired by spirituality, it actually does become possible to address this notion of um, essence or an ideal or perfection because we're talking about you know concepts like the heaven or eternal life or uh sort of the divine and so on which do have uh, uh or which can in fact be described um with the word perfection and uh, selwa argued that in using mathematics artists sort of um uh it helped them to, to curtail human error in the translation of these ideals into a visual form. Uh, now, the way that artists used uh, geometry and mathematics, of course, differed um, across the region and also from artist to artist. Here's another example by um, Kamal Bulata that we have in the show, which um, as is, you know, evident um, from just looking at it does have mathematics and geometry at the basis of its construction. And uh, not just mathematics, but mathematical grids as well. And um, in my introduction essay to the exhibition, I actually, um, I quote um, Rosalind Krauss's famous essay, Grids where she says, um, the grid functions to declare the modernity of modern art. And so, you know, for many artists at this time, you know, early 20th century, the grid really became this declaration of modernity. However, um, when you look at Bulata's trajectory, both, you know, in his personal life, but also in his career, you uh, also begin to recognize different um, sort of reference point for his use of mathematics. Uh, for instance, um, you know, he grew up copying the patterns on the facade of the Dome of the Rock in the mosaics of the on the facade of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem where he grew up. So um, one of his first kind of experiences with mathematical geometry came from there, as well as from his early training with the uh, icon church icon painter Khalil Halabi, who trained Bulata in the Byzantine tradition of icon painting, which again very much uh, is steeped in uh, mathematics and you know has the grid at the basis of its um, compositional construction. So the point that I'm kind of uh, trying to make here is that while visually these works um, are um, uh, are often compared or you know are subject to comparison to uh, other works you know from other parts of the world um, and visually they can in fact be uh, often very similar however when one begins to deconstruct their specific histories um, this is when you know you recognize that very often they are located along sort of different um, historical trajectories, political trajectories, and they also have, you know, kind of different stakes, um, whether it's historically, politically, art historically. Uh, and this is, I think, where it becomes important to account for these specificities. Um, another artist in the show that um, has a very interesting way of using geometry is Samia Halabi, also from Palestine. And these two works are both from the late 1960s, uh, which she made after a trip. Um, she, uh, you know, at this time she was teaching in Missouri and she received a grant to go and study uh, mosque architecture in, uh, I believe it was Egypt, Syria, 
and Turkey in Istanbul. And um, after coming back, she entered um, a phase sort of off where her work very much drew on geometry. However, for her, um, her engagement with, uh, with mathematics and, and Islamic um, patterns and Islamic geometry was not a very direct one in that she didn't necessarily translate what she saw into a different form, but rather studied the principles underlying the construction of these geometric patterns and then deployed those principles into the construction of her own geometric works. And these two are actually both uh, still lives. Uh, uh, Sami Halabi has a very interesting way of um, composing her still lives. So for instance, the one on the right um, is uh, made of a larger brown cube and or box in which she placed a smaller white cube and then painted them from the top. Uh, which you know can be is evident um, in the shadows around the white cube, indicating that it is a three-dimensional object. And the one on the left was actually made of two cylinders that were placed in a box and again painted from the top, um, as you know, sort of in plan view. Um, this is maybe a more loose understanding of you know geometry, but um, uh, this is a work um, by Kuwaiti artist Jafar Islah, who did receive his training in California, um, but in the early part of his career was very much fascinated and um, influenced by Kilim rugs. You know, he spent a while studying Anatolian Kilim rugs, like the 19th century example that you see here in the photo on the right, um, and then translated some of those formal elements into his own work as well, which is, um, I think, quite evident <laughs> in the rectangles here. Another constellation of works that you um, might find in the exhibition deal with the Arabic letter form and the deconstruction of um, Arabic alphabets. Again, one of the first individuals who is credited with uh, formulating or you know, articulating this sort of potentiality of the Arabic letter form to serve as a formal element in modern art is the artist Madiha Omar, whose work you see here. Uh, she wrote a text in 1949, um, while she resided in, in Washington, D.C. Um, about, you know, this, this kind of potential where she argued that each Arabic letter form is dynamic enough in order to form an abstract composition on its own. And um, here, you know, in this work, you can see uh, that she used elements of Arabic letter forms. So um, those of you who speak Arabic, who read Arabic might be uh, able to recognize some parts of letters, but they are not, in, you know, intelligible. So you wouldn't really be able to read um, uh, any particular word or or letter. Um, now, in later sort of research, the these works that made use of Arabic letter forms were kind of grouped under this larger umbrella of hurufiya or letterism. Um, but it would also not really be accurate to say that it was a movement per se in that it didn't really develop um, um, and, you know, at a particular point and then sort of spread outwards or, or um, it, it kind of just emerged in different parts of the region and also internationally um, and not only in the sort of Arab world, but in Pakistan, in Iran, um, in India as well, where artists just started experimenting with these, um, uh, you know, with this kind of mode of production without direct knowledge of one another uh, for the most, you know, for the most part. Um, another set of examples that you'll hopefully see in the exhibition are works by Kamal Bulata that we've already discussed with his yellow piece. And uh, here's another example from the same series. Um, what is interesting about Kamal is that he's, I think, probably one of the, um, the only one or one of the very few uh, artists in the show who uh, doesn't only abstract um, separate letters, but um, actually incorporates entire phrases into the construction of his work. So for instance, this one says, uh, or in the beginning was the word. Um, 
again, if it, it's difficult to read, um, even if you are an Arabic reader, um, with you know by the way that he interweaves and interlocks these geometric forms together. Um, another example from Egypt by Omar al Nakdi, who was also very much um, interested in Sufism, and this work comes from a period of his um, you know life and career that. To, to which he referred to as um, the Sawwuf or becoming a Sufi, where, you know, um, sort of meditative rituals and these transcendental experiences become key to, uh, to the construction of a work. So in this piece, you see a repeated um, uh, sort of articulation of what could be read as the letter Aleph, um, the first letter of the Arabic uh, alphabet, and also the first letter of the word God in Arabic, but also as the numeral one, uh, perhaps signifying kind of the, um, the unity of the divine. Um, so, you know, this is one of those cases where the line between you know, what is hurufiya, what is um, art inspired by spirituality, where do they intersect, and um, it becomes really interesting, you know, to look at the very different confluences, uh, sort of a confluence of, of references that these artists um, were engaging with. Um, another example by Shakir Hassan Al Said from Iraq, where um, he also makes use of letter forms in the construction of his, you know, the, the construction of his, I can't even call them paintings because they're often not just made using paint, but are kind of carved into and scratched and burnt and sometimes he even punctures all the way through his pieces. And uh, for Shakir Hassan Al Said, this idea of spirituality is also quite central. He, um, in the 70s, he authored a manifesto uh, or, you know, kind of um, gave birth to this movement called Al Bu'ad Al Wahid or the One Dimension, um, which also um, was very much steeped in the, you know, in meditative practices and, um, and, and rituals. And he even wrote that for him, creating uh, or making art painting is not a process of creation, but a process of contemplation. And this is another work um, of his that is uh, part of the Taking Shape exhibit. So I think that in the interest of time, I will stop here and hand it over um, to Nancy or Rachel, and we can probably take a few questions from the audience. Well, thank you so much, Suhaila, for introducing us um, to your thought process in constructing this wonderful exhibition. And um, I especially appreciate your sort of nuanced view of these categorizations of artists. Um, and I think that's something that, that we as art historians need to, uh, need to embrace, especially when we rethink abstraction in the mid 20th century. Uh, we've been so influenced by the groups that formed in the major centers like New York and Paris. <laughs> and um, you've shown us really with this groundbreaking exhibition that we, that we can't assume that the way we've written the story all along is, um, is airtight and the one that we should follow forever. So I congratulate you and Lynn for, for, um, for opening the scholarly world's eyes to um, some of the issues that we need to reconsider. Um, and I'm going to ask if there right now, I don't see any questions. Um, ah, here is one. Um, this is from Heather and she asks, is there a particular piece of work that stands out to you the most? Could you describe that work? Wow, that is probably one of the more difficult questions that, you know, we ever receive in exhibitions because as you work on it, you know, we've been working on the show for, um, 
you know, about three years, but actively for about two years, I'd say. And so you really get so, um, you really fall in love with kind of almost every piece um, uh, after such a long time. But, you know, I think maybe one of the more, um, you know, the ones that stand out is the piece that we have used for the cover of the catalog. And Nancy have shown a photograph of the catalog um, in your presentation. And it's a work called The Last Sound by Sudanese artist, uh, Ibrahim Salahi. And, um, you know, again, he's a very interesting uh, modernist figure who uh, in his work incorporates not only kind of uh, Arab or Islamic or African or Sudanese aesthetics, um, but finds very imaginative ways of merging them and also uh, creating things that are incredibly, you know, modern and groundbreaking in, in, in their own ways. And this work was produced after the passing away of his father. And uh, for him, it kind of documented, you know, the this passage of the soul from the material world into the uh, sort of more ethereal uh, space. And so in that way, it's a very touching uh, piece of art. We have a lot more questions now that have just come in. Um, from an anonymous attendee, uh, would you speak a bit more about the ways that the Islamic calligraphic tradition was drawn upon and reworked in some of these works? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, when we speak of harufi and letterism, there's definitely that kind of connection to Islamic calligraphy. And uh, some artists did, in fact, you know, study the principles of Islamic calligraphy and, uh, you know, scripts like the Kufic scripts and the Ma'il and, and, and other ones. Um, but also, this was really a departure from what classical Islamic calligraphy was and signified, you know, um, while yes, for some artists, they still retained links to the spiritual dimension of the letter um, and how it's used in, in sacred texts and also in kind of more spiritual rituals. But for others, you know, this was really a way to secularize the letter at a time when, um, these nations were modernizing, um, monarchies were, you know, kind of being toppled in a number of countries at this time. There was, um, you know, a rise in secular uh, political ideologies. And so that was also a way for many artists to divorce the letter form uh, from its religious connotations. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers, you know, begins to answer the question a little bit. All right, here's some more. This is from Dana Saji. Um, Saji, our professor of Islamic history. Um, and she thanks you for your lecture. And she says, Suhaila's comments helped me appreciate the aesthetic value of these works, which I got only after I listened to the context. I'm intrigued by the fact that the Bargil collection has pieces for their aesthetic value and others for their historical indication functioning like a primary source of sorts. I'm really intrigued, and she's asking you this, I think, about how you distinguish between the two. <laughs> Hi, Dana, I'm so glad you're here. Um, Dana and I have been in touch a little bit over the past few days. Um, you know, this is probably a question better directed at Sultan, but, um, you know, when, when decisions, when acquisition de decisions are being made, um, at the moment, you know, we don't really have a board that would, you know, a formalized board that would kind of um, have their input into how works are selected. So um, a lot of it is done intuitively, you know, we speak to each other, but also to our other colleagues and friends in the art world and in academia, uh, taking opinions and kind of doing our research that way. Um, as you can imagine, you know, because these artists and their uh, bodies of work are still being documented a lot of the times that a lot of the research that you end up conducting is like this, right? It's, it's through the word of mouth and uh, kind of through unconventional channels. Um, so I would say that there isn't one um, 
uh, one method that we use for the selection of you know what looks great or what has a great historical value. Um, it we really discuss every piece individually and um, and research every piece individually and then make the decision. Great. Um, here's another question from Sei He Yong. Um, who thought the, the lecture was wonderfully eye-opening and thanks you. And she said, you mentioned nationalist movements playing some role. Um, I wonder if gender featured in it in any way. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, this was, uh, you know, the 40s is when kind of the feminist movements um, had their, uh, palpable genesis in the region. Um, and um, this was articulated not only through abstract art, but through different kinds of art. And um, in the uh, curation of the exhibition, the idea of gender representation was an important one for us as well. So it's something we had in mind uh, trying to um, show a balanced representation, you know, a variety of voices and um, kind of make an, a deliberate effort to uh, to do the diligent research and, and maybe find out about the artists that we didn't know about before. And we do have a number of, you know, uh, interesting stories about acquisitions that happened in that period leading up to the exhibition where, um, you know, we actively looked for artworks uh, produced by women um, in those three to four decades. And uh, Sultan's social media was really a big help um, in this department. Um, we got a lot of um, fantastic responses from uh, people you know, across the region who knew someone or you know, had uh, a family member who was the neighbor of an artist, and that's how we were connected with a number of families and also artists that um, ended up actually being in the show, which is amazing. We have another question here from Sharon Bazarian, um, the head of our docent program. She asks, is there great interest in these works and other contemporary works in the Middle East today? I'm sorry, can you please repeat the question? Sure. All right. Is there great interest in these works and other contemporary works in the Middle East today? Well, I would say yes, definitely. You know, um, this sort of um, institutions uh, or centers of, of um, uh, institutional kind of representation of artists are shifting, you know, uh, across the region. But I would say in the past decades, probably. Uh, past two decades, um, from the 2000s onwards, um, there has been a rise in interest in, in um, regional art, um, specifically, you know, with art from the Arab world. It was in 2006, 2007, I would say, when the interest really peaked. Um, this is uh, when um, Nada Shabut's book on modern art from the Arab world came out, but also um, a, a number of um, institutions were established across the region. So for instance, in the Emirates where, uh, where uh, the Brazil Foundation is based, um, this is really when the art market kind of boomed with the establishment of auction houses and the Dubai Art Fair and a number of galleries, which you know happened kind of like between 2006, 2010. Um, so that really raised the interest. Um, and, you know, I think more and more uh, PhD students are looking at the region and more kind of uh, serious research is coming out um, on, on these artists in the past, uh, you know, past years. So I think that's a great sign. And here's a question from Mike Orlansky, one of our alums. Thanks for an excellent presentation. Can you point to any works in the exhibition that reflect American artistic influences or may have been inspired by the experiences of artists who lived in or studied in the United States? Yeah, well, uh, Jafar Islah, 
um, studied in California. Um, the Kuwaiti artist whose slide, I, you know, one of his works um, were in my slides. Um, Hamad Menahi also had experience in the US. Samia Halabi, of course, who still lives in, and practices in New York. Kamal Bulata and um, uh, Madiha Omar both studied in Washington. Um, Afaf Zureik did her master's at Harvard. Um, so there's definitely a number, <laughs> a large number of students. You know, this was a time when um, there was an increase in international travel specifically for study in, um, uh, for, you know, a lot of these artists. So the 50s was really when kind of, um, I, I would say more artists went to Europe probably. Uh, Europe and slash USSR, 50s and 60s, and later on um, to the US as well. And we have a question here from Laura Steinberg at BC, um, who thought your talk was fascinating. Um, and she's asking, how is the natural physical landscape of the Arabic world reflected in these works? And I know this is something you've addressed in one of the panels in the exhibition, so I'll let you. Yeah, I mean, many would argue that it did. Um, I don't unfortunately have any photos in my slides, but um, in, in several works in the show, you'll see kind of, you know, perhaps allusions to the desert landscape. You know, there's a few works that do kind of uh, use the ochres and browns and yellows um, in the construction of these landscape-like uh, compositions. So uh, yeah, it was definitely possible that the landscape did have an impact on, um, on the directions that the artists were taking. And also, you know, um, there was a tradition in, in some context of going out and painting into, you know, painting the landscapes. Uh, we often think of it more of, you know, sort of actual realist paintings of landscapes. Um, but with someone like Saliba Dwayhi, for example, um, he began as a figurative painter of uh, sort of village scenes and mountainous scenes and transitioned into what could be called sort of like hard edge abstraction, but they're still very much based on, on landscape. And then we have one from um, a professor of art in our department, Mary Sherman, who says, Keith Cricklow has written about geometric principles in Islamic art as being related to sacred geometry and the study of the cosmos. Did you also find this to be true? I mean, um, in some cases, maybe. Actually, let me pull up an image um, of an artwork by um, Egyptian artist, Minhat Hilmi. Um, just give me one second here. Uh, here I go, if I'll share my screen. Uh, this is one of the works that um, we acquired um, literally, you know, like a, a few weeks <laughs> before we couldn't add any more images to the book. Um, it's called Space Exploration or Universe. Um, and, uh, you know, is kind of an imagination of, of space um, in the, from the 1970s. But Minhat Helmi did, uh, you know, also base a lot of her work on and, and study Islamic geometry. And if you look at some of her other prints, um, you know, you can Google her or she has an, her uh, grandson made an Instagram page for her. You can kind of, again, see uh, the influences of Islamic geometry in her work. So, um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, to, you know, to kind of to see that uh, some artists did explore space. There's a few other works in the exhibition that um, explore space and the cosmos as well, but are not as uh, pronouncedly geometric in nature. Uh, so you can look at Ofemia Risk's work, for example, uh, which I believe is also called uh, Cosmos or Infinity. And uh, she, you know, she very much is inspired by space and sort of the planetary bodies and so on. And um, I think just one, one more question here. Um, in Western art criticism, there's a distinction between analytic and synthetic abstraction. 
In other words, abstraction, that's a distillation of observation versus abstraction, that's a product of imagination. Do these categories exist in the Arab tradition? Are there other categories? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. We got a very similar question uh, yesterday from uh, one of them. Yeah. yeah, right? Um, you know, I mean, I can't really speak to kind of the existence of these distinct categories because again, it's, it's sort of a field that is still, um, being you know documented and kind of a history that is being written so i personally haven't come across you know these specific kind of categories of thinking about abstraction in the arab world but i would say that definitely some abstraction um in the exhibition did you know was a result of observing the physical world and then you know abstracting it as a verb to something that is more non uh, objective like landscape or like you know um in some works you'll see sort of of, um, allusions to part uh, with bo the body, the human body or body parts. But at other times, like, you know, for example, with the artworks inspired by Sufi practices or by the letter form, you know, deconstructing of the letter form, um, this is when it comes into question, you know, can it, uh, can something that is not does not exist as a physical object in the real world can it be abstracted right so this is when uh, it becomes a little more difficult to kind of define it in these very neat categories and then one final question here from uh, Sophia Lombardo she says can you speak to how the abstract movement changed or developed throughout the Arab world from previous centuries to now? Right, I mean, well, if we think of uh, previous centuries, you know, what comes to mind in terms of abstraction it, are things like Islamic geometry and sort of patterns on um, textiles and metalware and body tattoos and so forth. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't venture out necessarily to kind of argue for a continuity of the tradition and it's morphing into a more modern expression. Um, I don't know if that was the case or, or if there was in fact sort of a rupture um, between what we call you know the islamic and then the modern in the 20th century um my sense is that it didn't necessarily you know it, it wasn't an uninterrupted uh lineage but artists um in the 20th century did begin to look back and sort of mine mine those um uh you know uh, types of, of, of movements or, or, or objects or, you know, let's say visual, visual languages like geometry and like, you know, sort of these abstract patterns for something new, for something uh, different, you know, sort of. Um, so I, my sense is that it was a reinvention of sorts rather than an in, uninterrupted lineage, if that makes sense. Well, um remains for me now to thank our speaker for this illuminating introduction to the exhibition and to convey our congratulations on co-curating this landmark exhibition.